You can just put two examples. That's okay. All right. All right, guys. So we're on the link. You click it. And make sure that you put your name. That way I can give you credit because otherwise I won't have a way of knowing who submitted that work. So let me put that link one more time. I have a lot of windows, so it's getting a little bit harder. While you are, when you are done with that, okay, for those of you that logged in a little bit early and you have already come up with that, go to your Google Classroom and download the interactive notebook template that we're going to be using for today. So once you get that Padlet, and for those of you that are just joining us, I'm just going to keep putting the link in over and over because as students join, they're not going to see the links because it was before they were here. So for those of you that have been here since 135, you're, you're getting the same link over and over, so you don't need to open it more than once. But for those of you that are showing up a little bit later, the link to the warm-up for attendance and participation today is on the chat box. Everyone else, once you're finished, you're going to go to your Google Classroom. You're going to go to Classwork. And I'm not sure if I'm presenting. I'm probably not, right? No. So let me present. So you're going to go over to your Google Classroom, go to Classwork. When you're done with your Padlet, when you're done with this, so two safety hazards for medical professionals, nurses, doctors, anybody that works with sick patients, or people that need medical assistance, paramedics, what kind of precautions do they face? So once you do that, you're gonna come here. Under Classwork, you're going to find the assignment for today, which it's not an assignment really, it's, it's a way for you to keep up with the notes today. So you're going to download it, okay? Because when you click on it, you cannot type on it. Now I know some students have shared today that they can hear me fine, but that the video is laggy, so if that's distracting you, you could just focus on the audio. But when you open this, you cannot click on it, okay? So the hello is just a fine. So what you need to do is you need to download it, right? And to do that, well, there are two options. One, you can open it with Google Slides. And if that works for you, you can do it that way. It hasn't worked for me today. So what I, what I would suggest is you go to open a new window. And when you do that, and you can also do this with the assignments on Google Classroom, because I know some of you have a hard time opening them, and I, com I commend you for being resourceful and using different, I think there's Cami Export or other things that y'all were using, and that's fine. But if if you want to save yourself the extra steps, you can just um, click on those little dots, open in a new window, and then you're going to hit download. And when you do that, you can open it. Okay, so today everybody's going to need the copy that they can type into. So everybody's going to need to download it or open it through Google Slides so that you can follow along. Okay, so when you do the Padlet, after you do that and the link, and I'll put it again one more time for those of you that joined a little later. I'm going to use this for attendance. After you fill in the, the Padlet, you're going to download the interactive notebook. Okay. So the interactive notebook in the classroom setting counts as a test grade. And so you guys keep your own notes, right? And then you, you have them organized. That counts as a test grade. For students, it was a lifesaver because there were tests that sometimes they struggled with where they had like an AP test and they had anatomy and they had like a calc test tests and it's too much so maybe they had to um, manage their time or they couldn't study so if they got a low test grade one of the ways to boost that is to turn in their notebook and so all you have to do is keep up with your notes so as we go through the synchronous session keep up with your notebook now as I mentioned I'm recording this session just in case you get kicked out or there's a situation where you can't access the presentation so I'll upload it at the end of the day. But if you kind of use that as a crutch to say, oh, well, Ms. Bino is going to upload it later, so I'll just do it right before it's due, you're going to be overwhelmed with the amount of work. Also, I'm going to just be doing periodic checks. Let's say maybe next week on Thursday, I'll be like, okay, guys, to make your interactive notebook for quiz grade. And so you want to be keeping up with it so it's an easy, easy, easy grade to help your average, okay? So um, you, you will be following along as we go through it today, and you'll be typing in the boxes, so you should have done it like that. All right, so today we're going to focus on safety. 
And rather than focusing on chemical safety or fire safety or electrical safety, we're going to focus on safety dealing particularly with our risks and hazards as, an, as anatomy students. And that is working with biological specimens. So you guys should have this table. So I'll give you a moment to open it. You're going to take out the hello that's on there. That was because we found earlier in the day that when I typed on my document, it was typing on the student's document. So that's why I had to reload it for you all so you had a blank slate. So as we go through today, where you all are going to be filling in, what are the risks? What is a biological specimen? We'll go through that in a minute. What are the risks of that? And how can you protect yourself? And so here on the last um, column, you see PPE or safety protocol. PPE stands for personal protective equipment. So in order to protect yourself from the hazards, you need to wear certain equipment that will prevent you from getting hurt or infected. And so probably on the news, you guys heard over and over PPE, PPE, right? The hospitals are short on PPE, there's not enough PPE. So masks are a form of PPE, personal protective equipment. And in our case, they help to reduce the transmission of the virus that causes COVID-19. But I'm going to wear this mask and I'm going to model it because I do see this a lot. I don't, I try not to go to grocery stores because I'm trying to reduce the risk of transmission. And also with the three kids, I can't really head out because they're not going to keep their masks on. So I, I order a lot of my groceries. But when I have, the couple of times that I have gone, this is what I see. And I'm going to call on one of y'all to tell me what's wrong. Okay. So give me a sec. Okay. All right. Eric. What is wrong with this version of wearing PPE? Uh, it's not covering your nose. Mm -hmm. So you can still so, like, inhale yeah. like bad air. Exactly. So when I see that, right, one of the things about our face, and thank you, Eric, you're right. Our face is has three openings that lead directly into our body. And so for the most part, our body is covered in skin, which fortunately, the top layer is dead. So the top layer of our epidermis is dead. And this is a good thing because, one, it makes it very hard for bacteria and viruses to grow on the dead surface. Two, there's very little moisture, so it makes it difficult for things like mold and fungus to grow on it. There are some body parts that are very moist. I know students hate that word, but they're moist, and so they're more likely to have like a fungal infection on them, like the feet. But for the most part, if your skin's not broken, if there's no cut, your skin does a great job at protecting you. But in your face, your mouth, is basically a tunnel or tube that leads directly into your stomach. So you're now inside the body. It also leads to your respiratory tract, right? Because you can breathe through your mouth. Your nose is right, is going directly into your lungs. So with the virus, right, with COVID, with the virus that causes COVID, it'll go into the lungs and cause an infection. And then the eyes, they're wet, right? They're mucous membranes. And so if you happen to get infected blood, tainted blood, even with the virus, now they're recommending face shields or wearing goggles or some form of glasses to prevent infection. Um, you can also get infected that way. So as we talk about personal protective equipment, you want to think about those things that could protect your eyes, your mouth, your nose, your skin, right? Because for the, like I mentioned, your skin is pretty good at protecting you, but if you happen to get a cut, you lose that protection because now there's a direct entryway into the bloodstream. Okay, so you should, everybody should have their table open. I don't have a lot of tabs because I had a lot of class periods today, but we're going to start here. Right, so as we go through today, you're going to type in there, like, what are the risks, what are the safety protocols, and we'll look at these, okay? This little link right here, you can click. So later on, you can click on that, and we're actually, it'll redirect you to the risks of formalin. So just to kind of give you a heads up, right now I'm not going to mess with that too much because I want to get through what we need to cover today, but that's there for y'all to click on. Ms. Pignon. Yes. It won't let us download it. There's a few of us in the chat that are saying that. Okay. What is it? What error does it give you? It just pops up another browser and it says it's like not a, a correct um, at all. Okay. So does it do this? Okay. You have this, right? Everybody that can, you have this. So you, did you click these little dots? Yeah. I open it in a new window and then. Okay. So here's what you need to have one more step left to go. And that is you have to hit download. Yeah, I did that. And then it you pops up the browser. Okay, it didn't download into your, down here? No, it didn't download it on my Mac. Okay, for those of you that are having a hard time, let me give you a link. I'm going to share it with you guys. Um, file, share, make a copy. I'm going to share that copy, so. And I'm going to put it in the chat box, okay? Right. 
share with you guys. I'll just put this share. You're going to have to make your own copy because if you don't make your own copy, whatever um, I enter in there is going to mess up your copy. So you need to, when I send it right now, oh, okay. you're going to have to just save it as your copy. So I'll show you right now. So let me go to back to the chat box. Miss, if it gives us the option to open it with Cami, can we do that? And we can Sure. Yes, yeah, so as long as you can access it, whatever you need to use, yes. As long as you can open it and type into it. So for those of you that couldn't download it, try the link. I'm gonna close this. Okay, and when you got the link, you should go to file and make your own copy. And then it should let you. So Eric, any success? I'm making my own copy, let's see, it's loading. When you guys get that set up, I'm gonna start here with the table. And yeah, I'll it, it, it did. Worked? Okay, yeah. great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me know. All right, we're gonna start with biological specimens. So, a biological specimen is anything that came from a living thing that was once a living thing. So, in the case of our course, we're going to dissect the cat. And these cats were strays. Um, some of them have fleas. We don't know if they had disease. One moment. What's going on? Okay. Um, and so the, the solution that they're in, you can see here there's a bag. There's a liquid called formalin, and that formalin basically kills all the bacteria that was on them, any fleas that were on them, um, essentially any diseases, but you still want to take precautions, right? You don't want to um, poke yourself with their teeth. Their mouths are closed shut, and they're in rigor mortis, so you can't really pry their mouths open, but some of them have their mouths a little open, and so you don't want to be sticking your fingers in there or anything like that, because you can cut yourself. Their teeth are very sharp. Um, with bodily fluids, we are going to use saliva in this class, because we're going to study the enzymes that start digestion, and digestion starts in the mouth. So in order to get saliva, we're going to, you know, some of your classmates are going to spit it out onto a napkin, and we're going to use some reagents and we're going to use some starch and we're going to actually start to see the digestive process and so with saliva since it comes from the mouth comes from a living person we run the risk of coming into contact with bacteria viruses or getting an infection right because that person could have a cold or flu virus or herpes so we want to take precautions um in the medical setting you can come into contact with another person's feces especially if you are responsible for um Caring for that patient as a nurse, uh, their urine, blood, vomit, mucus, all of those bodily fluids or biological specimens run the risk of infection. And so we want to protect ourselves. So as we are looking at that, think about some things that could protect your eyes, your mouth, your nose, or open skin. Okay, if you have, happen to have a cut that day, how can you protect yourself? Um, so for our class, really, it'll be saliva. When I was in college, um, one, of the, one of the labs that we did in microbiology is um, our teacher, had, or it was in the lab because you have a separate lab section and then you have your lecture. But in the lab, our teacher asked for two students to basically give us their urine. And so they went to the restroom during class. They collected their urine in a little um, sterile cup. And then we had to take our little Q-tips and dip it into our classmates' urine or pee and then grow the bacteria. So when you go into the college setting, you'll encounter more biological specimens, especially if you go into medicine. And so... Um, you definitely want to protect yourself. So I'm going to call in some of y'all to give me some of the PPE that you all came up with. So I'm going to come back here. And I can't see your faces, so I'm going to come back over here. And I'm Rebecca and Victoria, I'm going to ask you to give me one H, okay? So coming back over here. Rebecca, what did you come up with? What are some ways you can protect yourself? I'm sorry? I came up with uh, this uh, glove. Very good. Yep, you want to wear gloves when you're handling any someone else's urine, someone else's feces, vomit. Um, what about you, Victoria? What else did you get? I put, like, the mask and, like, wearing, like, goggles. Excellent. Masks, definitely you want to protect your, your mouth, your nose. Especially when you're dissecting the cat, some of that liquid can splash back on you. And so you want to protect your mouth so it doesn't get on there, your nose. And, and goggles, right, because we can also get some of that in our eye. There was actually... Go ahead. 
this um what if we can't type on it if you can't type on it click the link that's in the chat box and then you're going to put a file make a copy and if that still doesn't work um and you've tried downloading it you can take a picture of what's there and copy it on a separate sheet of paper but if you if you click the link and you make a copy you should be able to to, to type it but if not that's your other options you can just make the copy of it okay so let's go ahead and uh, look at formalin all right so formalin is the liquid that the cats are kept in when the living thing dies it's going to start to decompose almost immediately because our immune system like we're right now covered in bacteria but we're not we're not full of infections because our immune system keeps that bacteria in check when we die and the immune system is not working anymore the bacteria that are in our intestines that are in our skin that are in our mouth start to reproduce like crazy and they literally start to digest us so when living things die right away we start to decompose so we need to keep them from decomposing. And so if I come over here, I don't know where it went. Okay. There is a liquid that all specimens for dissection are put in, and that's called formalin or formaldehyde. You can see these brains are in that liquid. If they were not in that liquid, they would just be rotten, right? They would be rotted. There'd be nothing left after a certain amount of time. Formalin, though, because it interacts with tissue, it interacts with living tissue, it does have risks involved. And so let's look at what those risks are. So we want to protect ourselves. We want to limit how much exposure we have to formalin um, because it, it, over time, it can be pretty toxic. Now, formalin is a milder, watered-down version of formaldehyde, which is much more dangerous. So if you've heard of formaldehyde, um, you, it's basically uh, what, is, what has been used to preserve specimens. Nail polish has a little bit of formaldehyde. There are things in our environment that have formaldehyde, but with the dissection, dissections, there's more of it. So... I'm going to show you the risk. And so remember that in your PowerPoint, I showed you the little hazard, this little symbol. So we're going to go to that. And so I'm going to show you mine. So if we open it, you will have a copy of this already in the presentation. But if we look at, so this is basically the safety data sheet for formaldehyde, which is the stronger version, or also known as formalin. Right here you can see it as well. And what we want to be concerned about is what are the risks? So I'm going to go to hazard statements. And so if you were around us last year, when we were dissecting the cats, you probably got a good whiff of what it smells like. It's a very strong odor. Students have described it as smelling like a Sharpie, like a, like a very strong Sharpie. But if you look at the hazard statements, it does cause irritation of the respiratory system, which in our case would be our nose. And so we open up the windows, we open up the doors, we wear masks, although the mask doesn't really help so much with the fumes. Um, but it did cause students' noses to get runny, some of them might have gotten it on their skin and it caused them to get itchy. Um, so we want to wear gloves. Uh, we want to protect your clothing because the cats at first, when you get them out of the bag, they're super juicy. Like they're drenched in formalin. The fur is like trapping it all. And so they're like dripping formalin. So you want to protect your arms by wearing a lab coat. So all of these are things that you can be typing into your safety protocols, PPE, right? I mentioned a couple. Um, and with time, it has been exposed. It has been linked to cancer. Now, you're going to work with so little of it that your risk is very minimal, especially if you're protecting yourself, right? If you're not on your skin and you're not breathing it directly, then your risk is very small. Um, but you don't want to expose yourself over and over and over, let's say for years and years and years, dissecting cats because then the risk would go up, which is the risk that I have and the risk that I worry about because it is a potential risk of formaldehyde. It's a carcinogen. And so after like three periods or four periods every day, right, for like three years, uh, it makes me a little bit nervous. But for you guys, it's not. The cancer risk is really minimal. And so the way that I've described it, it would be like smoking cigarettes for a week versus smoking cigarettes for 10 years. If you were to try smoking or, and smoke for a week, the risk of getting lung cancer from that one week are zero or to slim, right? Versus somebody that has smoked 10 years, so you've been exposed to formalin for years and years and years in your career or your job, well, then that's different. So, but there are risks. You want to protect your skin. You want to protect your respiratory system, okay? And it's just a strong smell because we're trying to keep that living thing from decomposing, or that dead thing from decomposing. Okay, for scalpels. Scalpels are what we'll be using to dissect, and they are incredibly sharp, and students underestimate how sharp they are. And so when they're cutting, they'll put, you know, quite a bit of pressure. And on the right, you can see the cat. 
the goal of dissecting the cat is to look at the muscles. So we don't want to cut into the abdomen. We don't want the intestines spilling out. We don't want that, at least not at first, right? We don't want to see that. We just want to get to the muscles. And so students, when they start to cut, they don't realize how sharp the scalpel is. So they'll cut literally, because if you touch your stomach, right, there's no bone there. And so it's very easy to get into those internal organs, those intestines. And so we were having situations where students were cutting right into the abdomen and the intestines were spilling out, the liver was all cut up. And so then it was very difficult to like turn over their cat because all the organs were spilling out. So you want to make sure that you don't apply too much pressure. You're kind of aware of um, how sharp that scalpel is. You want to cut away from you. So again, these are all things for safety protocols because there's really nothing you can wear to protect yourself from cutting yourself with the scalpel. It's going to cut through a glove, especially a latex glove. But you can cut away from yourself. You can cut away from others. You can be aware of how you're holding that tool and not to have your fingers right underneath the blade. So you just have to be cautious with how you use it. And scalpels not only are they used in dissections in our, our classroom setting, but they're also used in surgery. So I do want to show you a quick video. I don't know how squeamish y'all are. I know there we have different sensitivities for the side of blood. So I'm not sure any blood in this video. I'll usually give you a disclaimer because I have had students that really cannot stand the, the, the blood. This is not real skin. We're not going to see any blood. But what you will see there on, on the man's hand in green is a scalpel. And it doesn't take a whole lot of pressure to cut into it. Okay? So he's not really, in fact, he's pulling the skin up. He's not even cutting so much into it as kind of holding the skin and cutting um, into it. So it's, it doesn't take a lot of pressure. They're very sharp. And so the risk here is cutting yourself. And if you do cut yourself, and when it has happened, for the most part, they're not very deep cuts. And the students, I guess, feel it and, and they just stop what they're doing. But you definitely want to report any injury to these body they just Okay, so you want to be very careful. Usually the person that cuts, we call them the surgeon. So every one of y'all will have a job. So they will be the surgeon, and you will be the surgeon's assistant, and things like that. Okay, so for your table, you should have, as I was talking about them, right, what are some safety, safety protocols of cutting away from you and others? You also don't want to walk around with a scalpel in your hand. If you need to throw something in the trash or you need to go wash your hands, you don't want to take the scalpel like you want to leave that at your station. Okay? So um, the formalin, where are some ways we can protect ourselves? What are some ways we can protect our skin? Formalin and biological specimens will have very much of the same PPE, right? the same protective equipment, like gloves, et cetera. The last one we want to look at is glass. And so for glass, um, we are going to work with glass because we will be looking at your cells underneath the microscope, your cheek cells, which will also have saliva, so that's the biological hazard. But um, so slides, if you've never worked with the slide, it's like a thin glass that you put your cheek cells on or you're using to see things under the microscope. And they're so thin that because students don't have a lot of practice and focusing, oftentimes, so here's the slide, here's the microscope lens, it gets so close that they break it. And that is probably the number one um, labs and interview will that we will have or those microscope slides breaking. And so what I've seen in the past and what I don't want to occur is students, I guess sometimes they feel nervous or uncomfortable that they broke the slide so they don't say anything. And what they do is they kind of brush it off to the side and uh, they leave. At the end of the day, they leave, right? They go to the next class. And so what happens is the students that come in next period, there are little shards. I mean, they didn't clean it up and you're not supposed to clean the class. That's not your job as a student. That's my role. Um, they'll cut themselves, right, on these little shards, or I've cut myself where I'm cleaning up, and then you get have shards, right, that I've cut. Um, and so the safety protocol for this is you want to let the teacher know if there's broken glass, because that way I'll clean it up. So the student should never handle the broken glass. It's the teacher's job. So just let me know if that's the case so I can handle that glass and clean it up. Also, if we were to throw that glass, let's say, for example, you took it upon yourself, to clean that, which you're not supposed to, but let's say that you did. Let me come back over here. Mm -hmm, yeah. So let's say, for example, um, you were to cut it, and I'm trying to see your faces. Um, Alyssa, have I called on you yet? No. What would be the risks of throwing that glass in the trash? Like, who would be in danger now if we were to throw glass in the trash can? Think about who comes um, out here and cleans up. Well, the janitors. That's you, right. So. Mm -hmm. You're right, because the janitors are not expecting broken glass. So if it's like cutting, you know, poking through the bag, they're going to get injured. So, yes, thank you, Alyssa. Um, the janitors would be in danger. So you don't want to. I love it. I think love it. Okay. 
So safety protocols in front of the teacher, don't clean the classroom. All right, for the next part, what we're gonna look at are some measurements. So if you're here on your PowerPoint, your table should be filled in now. You should have taken out that hello, that was just, you were noticing that when I typed it, went on to the other person. So now we're gonna look at some measurements, okay, especially those dealing with medicine. Oh, 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 All right, so while you guys find that, I'm going to try to handle the situation. I'll be right back, and we're going to look at some measurements, okay, because you're going to have some practice problems tomorrow that deal with what we're about to cover. So give me a sec. Maybe she'll just distract herself. Maybe you too. Okay, so when we look at this, when it comes to science, there is a disconnect with how we measure in science and in everyday life. We're one of the few countries um, that uses what's known as a customary oh, system. Help. Most countries in help, the world mommy. use the metric system. Help. So if you were to travel to Canada, to Mexico, to Europe, you would find that when they take measurements of distances from one city to another, help. or somebody's height, they're using this metric system. So when we, since we don't often work with liters, milliliters, centimeters, kilometers, it's kind of difficult to understand the sizes of them or how much a, a liquid a liter is. Like, for example, if you lose four to five liters of blood, that's enough to go into shock and die. Well, how much is one liter? Like, how much exactly is that? If I were to reword that and say, if you were to lose three cups of blood, that would be enough to go into shock and die. Well, I think you have a better grasp at what three cups are. By the way, three liters and three cups, they're completely different. So it, I'm just using that as an example. Um, but sometimes it's difficult for students to make that transition because they don't practice the metric system enough. So the goal of right now or today is to, to practice becoming familiar with that because when you're looking at patients and medication and um, massive organs, like if we were doing autopsy and you were taking the mass of a heart, you're going to find that in the metric system and not the customary system. So I want us to at least get that exposure and have access to it in our notebooks. So when we look at problems later on, you kind of have that as a reference, okay? So let's go over here. So you guys are in your table. I know I'm switching back and forth through a lot of things, but you guys are here, right? And we're going to do this together. Now, on my end, it's really small. So if you made the copy and you have this uh, view like mine, you can zoom in. Okay, so I just hit the little zoom and I went to 100. So that way I can type a little better. So what you have in front of you is you have this table. Um, and it kind of already tells, gives you some conversion. So one inch, which we know is not that long is the same as 2.5 centimeters one kilogram is the same as about two pounds and so you'll be able to use this when we go into our problems next this part you don't have to memorize you can always reference that whenever you need. so um let's look at the mass unit so mass is to take essentially the weight now weight it's going to factor in gravity, so that wouldn't be so much the technical term, but just to give you an example, if you were to take the weight of a patient, you're taking the mass. So we're going to use this for solids, right? We're going to take the mass of an organ, the mass of a powder to make a medication if you're going into pharmacology to be a pharmacist. But we're also going to consider this like the weight of something. You guys can be typing this on your end. And for mass, we are going to use grams. In our particular class, and see, what you can do is, since this all looks the same to me, if I want to see what the notes are, I would recommend that you highlight them or you change a different font. You don't have to do this for you, for your end, but it's uh, something that might be useful to kind of tell the information apart. So grams, we're going to abbreviate with a G. For our classroom, we're going to use kilograms, because that's about, the person's pretty heavy, so we're going to go into the kilos. And... We're also going to use milligrams. If we were to do like a powder, for example, or a very small um, mass and be a capsule or something like that, that's not a lot. So we would use the, the smaller version. So in my end, see, it ran over, so I can make it smaller so it all fits. So you guys can play around with the dimensions of your notes. You don't have to highlight it, but I'm just doing it since I'm presenting the information to you. All right, volume is going to be for liquids. So as I mentioned earlier, the volume of blood loss, right? Four to five liters is enough to go into shock. If you're giving somebody an IV, um, you're going to measure how many milliliters you're going to give them per hour. 
So anytime we're looking at liquids, we're going to be focusing with, or working with leaders. We're going to use a capital L for. And for our purposes, we're either going to measure a lot of liquid or we're going to measure very small amounts of liquid, like a lot of tiny little bits. Um, so we're using liters and milliliters. There's kiloliters, there's um, centiliters, but for our purposes, we're just going to use these values. Now, as I type, I'm going to come back to y'all. Um, Mommy, Dad. It's Elmo. As we type, as I type, Daddy. is it typing onto yours? Daddy. Mommy, Dad. You guys can put yes or no in the chat box. Mommy. As I'm typing on my end, is it typing on your copy? Uh, yes or no? It doesn't type into ours. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. So that was happening earlier. Okay. So many tabs. Okay. Length is going to be for the relative sizes. Right? How long is that bone? How tall is that person? So I don't think for length, I mean, you can put size, but I'm just going to, it's pretty self-explanatory. So we're going to use meters. And we're going to use a, a lowercase m. Now, we can use centimeters. That's a small amount. We often use that. We also use millimeters, which are on a ruler, the tiny lines. And most students have a hard time finding those because they're the really itty bitty lines that are even smaller than the centimeter. And so, like, for example, when I got my braces um, in middle school and they were measuring my overbite, so I had an overbite, or, like, the distance between your teeth, those are very small distances, so they were using millimeters. Kilometers, we're not going to use that on the human body. That's too much of a huge distance, so you're not going to be working with kilometers in this class. Um, okay. And then for temperature, we're going to use Celsius. And so for Celsius, we use the C. Just to save time, I'm not going to find the little symbol, but we should have the degree symbol. Um, and this is also probably difficult to work with because if when we think of somebody having a fever, 100 degrees, 101, right away, like that clicks for us, that is a fever that is higher, and you can look at the table with a 98.6. But if you were to hear, oh, my temperature, the nurse said it was 37 degrees Celsius. At first, it doesn't register that that is normal body temperature, right? Because we think of these high numbers because of Fahrenheit. So when you go into medicine, we're traditionally here in the hospital, they'll still measure that in Fahrenheit because it's so often used, but Celsius is the correct measurement. So 37 degrees Celsius is equivalent to 98.6. So we want to use Celsius in science um, because that's the metric unit, okay? So you all have some references here, like one meter is the same as 100 centimeters, etc. We're not really going to work so much on conversions rather than just becoming familiar with how to use these units. So let's do a practice problem together. So tomorrow, I'll leave some more problems for you all to work with. So this will be your reference. So you'll have this in your notebook. So it says, an IV is infused at 100 cc's per hour. So an IV, IV stands for intravenous. If somebody is hospitalized and they're in a coma or they're about to get surgery, um, they cannot have any, like, well, if you're in a coma, you can't eat, right? But you need to stay hydrated and you need to be fed. So you're going to be fed and hydrated through an IV through your vein, essentially, and through venous. And so they'll have these IV bags. They're mixed with sodium, potassium, glucose, all those things that your cells need, and they'll drip it into your veins slowly. There's a certain rate at which they drip it because if they put it in too fast, your veins could burst. And so this problem is addressing that. Um, if you're about to get surgery, you can't have anything in your stomach because uh, the anesthesia they give you might make you vomit during surgery, and you can't be vomiting when you're paralyzed because you could choke on your vomit, so your stomach will be empty but to keep you hydrated through IVs. And so in this example, it says that an IV is infused or given to the patient at 100 cc's per hour. And we haven't looked at cc's. You've probably heard of cc's before. But if you look at the table, 100 cc's is, is the same as what you make. So we're talking about a liquid. So kind of think about that. But if you look at the table, um, let me call in one of y'all. I can't, Alba, uh, uh, one cc is the same as what? One what? It's the same as right here on the green one table. inch. Wait, no, right, one milliliter. Excellent, right? Milliliters we know one are for liquid. So that not, uh, adds up. Thank you. So it's the same. So basically, an IV is put into the patient at 100 milliliters per hour. It's not a whole lot for four hours. So the patient's getting these 100 every hour, right? For a total of four hours how many milliliters were infused in four hours. 
So how would we solve this problem? Anybody want to chime in? Because I can't see everybody's faces. I can see y'all. Let's see. <laughs> it won't let me. Yanareli. Uh, Hi. So how could we solve that? We're going to be multiplying some numbers, but how can we figure out how much fluid this patient got in four hours? If you're getting 100 every hour. What can we do? Do you have to convert CC to milliliters? Mm, you know what? It's already pretty much given for us, so we know that 100 cc's is the same as 100 milliliters. So mm -hmm. in this case, we don't have to convert. We may have to convert in other problems. But how many milliliters is the patient getting in an hour? Do you just multiply 100? Yeah, so just multiply. So I heard um, 100 per hour, right? So if you're yeah. getting 100 per hour, we know there are four hours. So we're going to multiply that times four, and that would be 400, right? Now, if I turn in this, and I, my math is right, right? Why would I get this incorrect? Why would the teacher count it wrong? Because you need to change the... Uh, add the measurement. Yeah. Yeah, right. I need to add the measurements because if you just pour yeah. 400, 400 what? Like, in, I, obviously, I can assume while they're working a, a liquid problem, so it's going to be milliliters. That's for liquids right here. But in, in science, especially, we don't want to make assumptions because if we make assumptions, we can hurt someone, uh, especially when we're dealing with a patient. So we want to make sure that we're very explicit about what you know, it's super important that you put milliliters, grams. Um, whatever is going to apply. So since that's the answer, I'm just going to highlight it. Okay, there it is. Okay, so it's 213. We leave at 320. No, wait. Wait, what? We leave at, I'm sorry, what time? 2.30? Let me check the calendar. 220. 220? 220. Right. Thank you. I actually put three. So I'm going to give you all the next five minutes to go take a work on these the next couple problems to try to solve them on your own, and we'll go through them. You, these next five minutes, you can also take a bathroom break if you need to. So I'm going to put up a timer. Okay, and so you have five minutes to look at the other problems, and then we'll go through them together. Okay.
I'm just gonna use my voice. Um, that way there's not that lagging distraction. I want this. Okay, so I, want this. I know we have a little bit of time, but on the timer, but I wanna make sure I get through it before we cut out today. So for number two, it says the patient weighs 84 kilograms. So we're using kilos, right, because it's the third mass. Um, how many pounds does this patient weigh? So PT stands for patient. So if we come back over here, right, we're going to use our table. We know one kilogram is the same as 2.2 pounds. So we're going to use that. So we're going to go ahead and put, okay, the patient's 84 kilograms times 2.2. That's a conversion. And it should have gotten 184 pounds, right? around that variation and we have to add pounds. Now pounds are customary but those are the units of the problem. So, is that what y'all got? I know some students were getting 184 point something. So, anybody get something vastly different than that? It, they could have a decimal to it. For the next one, the patient is five foot uh, five feet, 10 inches tall. So the, here's the feet, here are the inches. How many centimeters is this? All right, so the first thing we have to do is figure out how many uh, inches total are in this person's height. So we know, okay, so five feet, there are 12 inches in a foot. So this person is 60 inches so far, right? Then, to that 60, we're going to add 10 because that person's 5 foot 10. So we want to add the 10 inches that they also have to the height. Bam. I don't know if I just deleted something. Plus 10. That gives me 70 inches. But that's not the answer because we have to turn these inches into centimeters. So when we come back into our conversion table, one inch is the same as 2.5 centimeters. So again, we're going to multiply. And we're going to take those 70 inches times the 2.5. And does anybody want to chime in with the math? What did you get? 175. 175 centimeters. 175. Awesome. So that is the answer. So a lot of this math, I know in chemistry, with stoichiometry, you guys were going from one unit to another, and there were a lot of formulas and things that you had to apply. But for our purposes, we're just doing very basic math. Multiply, divide, understand units, okay? And then for the last one, very simple. The medicine comes in 16 milligram doses. The doctor wants the patient to take 120. So in this case, we divide 120 by 6. So the, the patient needs two, two doses, right? To get to 120. Alrighty, guys, so make sure that you'll have this. Tomorrow you'll have some assignments. I recorded the lesson, so I will post it on Google Classroom. If you need a little bit more time or you need to rewind, um, you can do that. Okay? So have a great day. Make sure you finish the Padlet for credit, and I will see you all on Friday, face to face. Okay? Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. Miss. Bye. Bye. See you later. Christina, can you hear me? You too, Luis, thank you. Okay, Christina, um, let me double check. Christina, Christina, Christina. Yeah, oh, no, that's Christian. No, I don't have you for attendance. If you didn't do the Padlet, obviously I'll mark you now because you're talking to me. I did the, I did the Padlet. Um, I did? just came, I came in, like, I was doing something with my dad, but I, I did it as soon as I came in. Christina. Let me double check. Oh, I'm right there in the <laughs> left corner. You saw it? Okay. You saw, if you saw your name, then you're at the top. Okay. Bye. Bye.